Welcome to the Rosenberg Roundup, a weekly podcast providing investors with key macro and market developments, insightful data analysis, and actionable ideas that are top of mind for the Rosenberg research team in the week ahead. I'm Dylan Smith, and this is the Rosenberg Roundup. Earlier this week, I sat down with Dave Rosenberg, our founder, president, and chief economist. We discussed the hot start to the year in markets and economic data, and why we're still sticking to the recession call that we outlined in our 2024 outlook. That will form the bulk of today's show, but first, the week in review. The big data point this week was January CPI, and it was not an encouraging print, with annual inflation staying above 3%, and core measures rising. Bond markets hated the data point, with the 10-year Treasury yield popping over 10 basis points on the release. That's because the elements of the report the Fed focuses on, including core services prices, were all higher than expected and won't give Chairman Powell the increased confidence that inflation is returning sustainably back to target that he needs to start the cutting cycle. It's worth pointing out that there was some positive news in the details, Cyclical sectors of the economy are not showing much price growth at all, and core goods prices deflated outright. But for markets, that wasn't the takeaway, and we'll have to wait for further deceleration in prices for bond markets to pay back this week's losses. On the topic of the Fed's first cut, next week we'll see the release of the minutes of the Fed's January meeting. That's the meeting where Chairman Powell pushed back on market pricing of a cut by March and introduce the threshold of further confidence in the inflation trajectory in order to bring that first cut in. We'll be looking to the minutes to get a stronger sense of what the FOMC participants might consider sufficient evidence to give them that confidence. We'll also be scanning the minutes for a little more detail on the Fed's quantitative tightening program, which will be reviewed in the March meeting, and likely with a view to slowing and eventually stopping balance sheet runoff. We had rich pickings for our spotlight feature this week, Earlier in the week, we published one for the nerds, a deep dive on recession probability modeling, comparing different models and finding that the best ones did not signal a U.S. recession in early 2023, correctly as it turns out, but they are signaling a very high probability of recession for 2024. We also put out a piece showing that estimates of the output gap, the difference between actual economic activity and the theoretical potential of the economy, have become a lot less reliable after COVID-19. That's a problem for forecasters and policymakers alike, because the output gap is typically seen as a good long-term inflation gauge. But the piece we've decided to spotlight addresses a common question we get from our clients and subscribers. How important is the income distribution and inequality for consumer spending? My colleague Atikan Bagishkan did some excellent work triangulating different databases on spending and income in the US to uncover some important insights on what drives spending. He found that the top income quintile, the wealthiest 20% by income, drives over 40% of total consumer spending. But it's much more variable than any other quintile and not well correlated with the others. So in short, high income earners account for most of the fluctuations in the business cycle and typically drive the turning points. The top income quartile is also the only one that is positively correlated with equity returns although the effect is small enough that only abnormal returns, a recessionary bear market, for instance, or a huge bull run, make a meaningful difference on aggregate spending. For economists, we picked up a small but meaningful wealth effect. That's only one element of our findings from what became a richly detailed report. And as always, you can learn more about this and other topics by following the link in the description. For today's interview, I'm glad to welcome back to the pod our founder and president, our chief economist, captain of the SS Rosenberg Research, Dave Rosenberg. Dave, thanks for stopping by. Dylan, thanks for inviting me back on the call. And uh, let's hope that this uh, ship stays afloat. You were on a few weeks ago to talk about our 2024 outlook. Uh, And since then, we've had a few key data points move against our recession call in the US, to put it mildly. And I'm speaking here about the big upside surprise to Q4 GDP, a similarly massive surprise on payrolls, which not a single forecaster saw coming, and even stronger ISM PMI data than anyone was expecting. Now, that's caused some prominent bank economists, who we could name but we won't, to throw in the towel on their recession calls, and we're starting to feel a little lonely out here. 
So my main question for you today is just to explain to our listeners why we're sticking to our guns. Sure. Well, uh, I think that being alone is different than being lonely. Uh, I don't feel lonely, but we are alone. And what does that mean? It means that we are not following the herd. Uh, And I think that uh, it always pays to be unique and not be part of the consensus, especially when we have a lot of evidence the other way, uh, which you didn't mention. Um, Like, for example, everybody bows down to the holy grail of GDP, which is about spending. And the spending last year was a lot of government stimulus and a lot of consumer leverage. And I will be the first to say that I did not anticipate that we would finish the year with the personal savings rate at 3.7%. It's less than half the pre-COVID level and compares to the historical norm of 9%. Uh, So where's the savings rate going from here? If we were at 9%, I could give a forecast that we're going down to 3, 4, 5 and have a consumer spending boom. But it's just like the stock market with a 21 Ford multiple. Where do you go from there? And a savings rate of 3.7%, where do you go from there? Uh, Admittedly, the fourth quarter was strong GDP. Uh, I think a lot of that was uh, leveraged. We had For example, the New York Fed's consumer debt report just come out, right? And it showed that over 100% of the increase in consumer spending in the fourth quarter was all debt financed. That doesn't seem sustainable for one reason. And the two of us both wrote about this, uh, which is that delinquency rates, especially for autos and consumer credit, are at their highest level in uh, 12, 13 years. Um, So uh, no reason to throw in the towel. Uh, you know, it's as I said, it's like in our perch in Toronto, it's like saying, oh, the recession hasn't happened in December. It's like saying it hasn't snowed in December, therefore winter's been called off. I don't believe the business cycle's been repealed. And in fact, there's uh, a lot of other data that are supporting our call. Uh, real gross domestic income uh, looks to have been flat last year. Industrial production was flat last year. And there's three accounts. There's the product accounts, the income accounts, the spending accounts. And just like the non-farm payroll number, you know, it's funny that people talk about jobs, 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 but nobody talks about hours, hours, hours. And the work week, the work week, which is a leading indicator, was down six-tenths of a percent in January. Nobody talks about that. Uh, But the body equivalent, when you count the hours and the jobs, in January was equivalent to a 550,000 employment decline. And nobody talks about that. If you believe in the non-farm payroll survey, then the labor market actually shrunk holistically in the month of January. So I actually think the numbers, notwithstanding the happy face that the Fed has on and pushing out the rate cuts um, and the stock market doing what it's doing, I actually think the numbers beneath the numbers are actually supporting our view. These, I mean, these discrepancies you're mentioning between different um, indicators and even within the same reports, it's a big theme that we've been pushing at the moment. Uh, have you ever seen a situation like this where there's there's so much kind of mixed signals coming through from different areas of the economy? Is that a typical turning point sign or has something changed after COVID that no one understands? Well, it's not unusual to see the household survey and the payroll survey diverge. And the household survey usually does, even though it's it's a smaller sample and there's more noise in the household survey, it tends to be a better leading indicator at turning points in the cycle in both directions. Frankly, between GDP and GDI, the gap is unprecedented. Um, but GDI, you know, has rents, it has wages, it has profits, it has interest income, it doesn't have government spending. We had huge, the fiscal deficit ran up 25% last year. Uh, and there's no leverage on that, right? It's uh, the, so the, the, the gap, and so it's really a leverage spending story. The gap between spending and incomes has never been this wide. So, no, I haven't seen that before, but you're quite right. The answer is that we are probably two or maybe three standard deviation points away from any semblance of normality when it comes to the diversions, as you said, even within specific reports, which is why, which is why Powell, uh, when he was at the podium at the last FOMC meeting at the presser, what did he say? He said, we are spending more time focusing on anecdotal information. And specifically, I'm not seeing a Fed chairman do this, specifically reference the base book a few times. And this is what I'm getting at, that the base book, when you look at the tone of the base book, half of the country is already in recession on the precipice thereof. Uh, and in fact, we went back. We went back to all the base books back over the past 30 years. And this base book read more 
negatively downbeat on the economy than the ones we had ahead of the last three recessions. So yeah, there's um, and I think part of that could be the response rates as well. Uh, I mean, that's a more of a, of a technical issue. But I do think that the veracity of the government data, and look, I am not into conspiracy theories, okay? But the veracity of the government data, I think, is um, is being put to the test right now. Yeah, I think a lot of our listeners would sympathize with the idea that, you know, how people feel about the economy and what's being reported on the headline is is not quite, you know, dovetailing at the moment. Maybe to end on a positive note, um, Anything you're particularly excited about? Any developments in the last few weeks that you know you'd like to point out? Well, I think that uh, if you are a a fan of consumer frugality, uh, which uh, I guess that's a is that a dirty word that starts with F? Uh, frugality. Uh, but I, I think that look in, in the past month, what have we had? We had two of the leading retail experts on our webcast. We had Roger Lipton, who covers the restaurants, and then we had Dana Telsey, who was like the dean of all retail in the United States. And they both had the same message, which was frugality. I mean, what did Roger talk about? I mean, plate sharing. And Dana talked about how even the wealthy are trading down. Um, So it leads me to have a view that, yeah, I, I think I'm probably getting more excited over the low end, uh, say, discount stores, um, you know, the the areas of the consumer space that caters uh, towards um, uh, towards uh, frugality. You know, it's the one thing, and I think you and I talked about this. That I think the one the one retailing stock that either, either made you money or certainly preserved your capital in the last three recessions was Walmart. So the billionaires are now shopping at Walmart. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm I guess that you could say that I'm probably bullish on. Uh, consumer staples, and I'm very bullish, by the way, on a lot of things outside the United States. And our last, our last strategizer was really pound the fist on the table bullish on uh, on Asia. And we've been fans of Japan, still are for structural reasons. But uh, ex Japan Asia, the stock market there is trading at the same multiple the S and P 500 was back in the summer of 1982, which was, and you, you know, and that would that would have been being bullish in the summer of '82. People don't forget everybody's whipped up and bullish on the U.S. stock market right now. Uh, but in the summer of 82, people were hiding under the table screaming uncle. Uh, and that's the way it looks in wide swaths of Asia right now. That is another contrary trade, but a very cheap market. And uh, we had Peter Bookvar on our webcast um, just the other day. And uh, he's a brilliant global investor. And that's where he's putting his money. So... Yeah, what's got me excited is this trend towards uh, the frugality theme getting small uh, in the United States. There's a whole investment theme around that, by the way, and we've written about that. But also, I am getting increasingly optimistic over uh, over emerging Asia. Excellent. Lots to chew on there. We'll make sure that we put a link to the webcasts in the description. We've had a few great ones lately, as as you've mentioned, and I, I think those are good to check out. Very different format to the podcast. They're long form. They last a whole hour, and we really get deep. So we'll make sure you can get to those. Dave, thanks for coming in. Always good to talk. Really appreciate it. All the best. Take care. Our weekly trip to Canada Corner will be very brief indeed, as the news flow was thin and data were light in the Great White North. But one question that's increasingly coming into focus for us and for markets is who will move rates first between the Bank of Canada and the US Fed? That's a very important question for foreign exchange markets and also for bond investors. Canada's frothy housing sector aside, there is already a strong case given very low demand to provide some interest rate relief to the broader Canadian economy. As markets continue to push out the timing of the first Fed cut after this week's CPI and PPI data, the possibility that Canada in fact moves first is becoming stronger. Next week we'll get a fresh Canada inflation reading, which will help markets assess the Bank of Canada's likely rate cut timing And we'll be sure to discuss that in next week's Canada Corner. On that note, it's time to wrap. I'm Dylan Smith, and that was the Rosenberg Roundup. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Rosenberg Roundup. For more information on our work and to take advantage of a free 30-day trial of our research, please visit rosenbergresearch.com. Make sure to tune in to our next episode for more insightful analysis on the macro and market landscape. 
Rosenberg Roundup is provided for general information and entertainment purposes only and does not constitute legal or professional advice, nor is it an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to purchase any security or derivative. Any views expressed by the participants of Rosenberg Roundup are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, beliefs, or policies of Rosenberg Research. 